Welcome to the Best Interest Podcast, where we believe Benjamin Franklin's advice that an investment in knowledge pays the best interest, both in finances and in your life. Every episode teaches you personal finance and investing in simple terms. Now, here's your host, Jesse Kramer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 54 of the Best Interest Podcast. My name is Jesse Kramer. Today, we're going to talk all about FIRE, the FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. If you're a personal finance aficionado, you probably know about FIRE in some way, but if not, this episode will get you up to speed and we're bringing in an expert later. His name is Brad Barrett. He's the host of the Choose FI podcast, one of, if not the most popular personal finance podcasts out there. And Brad is going to sit down with us to explain his view of the FI movement, of the FIRE movement and a little bit about how he achieved financial independence himself. So really excited to bring Brad on to the podcast. But first, let's define what financial independence is. Let's get into a little bit of the numbers themselves, the objective numbers about how you can achieve financial independence in your life, and then a little bit of the why. You know, a big question, why pursue financial independence in the first place? Okay, so for starters, let's talk about the FIRE movement, F-I-R-E, financial independence, retire early. If you are a personal finance nerd, you probably already know about FIRE, but let's, let's get you up to speed if you don't know what FIRE is. The main idea is quite simple. If you save enough money, then you can cover all your living expenses via interest or gains from your investments. That's financial independence. You have enough of an investment bank put away that the growth, the year-over-year growth of your investments will completely fund your lifestyle. You're no longer living off of a paycheck. You don't need to hold down a job because you're living off your investment interest or your investment growth. It's definitely possible to reach FI before traditional retirement age. So some people who reach FI, they choose to retire early, R-E, getting us the full acronym F-I-R-E. So let's do a little bit of quick starter math. Uh, Imagine if you saved a million dollars. I know it's a lot of money, but over the course of a career, saving a million dollars is very achievable. And then you assume that your $1 million nest egg grows by a net average of 4% per year. And we're going to come back and dig into the details of that 4% number. But 4% is a fair, slightly conservative growth amount. 4% of 1 million is $40,000 per year. So ostensibly, if you could live off $40,000 per year, you could live off your investment interest forever without ever tapping into the original $1 million. It's time back just to, you know, figure out what you're going to do with all your retirement time. Uh, It's simple, but that is fire in a nutshell. If there's any one takeaway, just remember that math example. You know, 4% of X gives you a certain amount to live off per year. However, we're going to start to caveat that statement a little bit, and we are going to break down in detail later where that 4% number comes from. It comes from something called the Trinity Study. And we're going to talk about why the Trinity Study actually is very misunderstood by the FIRE community. It's understandable why. Unfortunately, uh, the FIRE community, you know, we we want to break things down into simple terms so people can understand them. And the 4% rule is one of those shorthand simple terms. However, there's much more nuance to the 4% rule than the average person thinks. So if you are a DIY type investor, Maybe you're younger and you're starting to plan out your retirement in your own head. You're starting to figure out how much you need to save for that. I highly recommend you wait till later in the episode when we dig into the details of the 4% rule because it's, it's really enlightening and important that you understand that. But first, let's talk about why FI is great, even if you don't reach full fire. The tenets of financial independence are essentially that you should save more money and spend less money. And that's terrific advice. It's kind of like saying eat more vegetables. Odds are that advice applies to you. Even if you're already doing enough of it, doing more of it is only helpful. One of the main ways we accomplish that is essentially just by living a a frugal life, trying to save more of our money and spend less of our money. One of the most important ratios in FIRE, in the FIRE movement, is called your savings rate. Your savings rate essentially says, how much of your income are you saving out of every paycheck? Or, you know, you can approach it the other way. How much of your income are you spending out of every paycheck? 
And the higher your savings rate, the more quickly you will achieve fire. And the reason why is it's almost a twofold reason. It's, it's kind of important to understand because on the one hand, if you're spending less money now, of course, we know that means you're saving more money. So that's good. But also if you're spending less money, that means that in your retirement, you will need less money to live off every week, every month, every year. So not only do you save faster, but it also means that you need less in the long run. Pursuing financial independence, it requires knowledge of your investments, of your retirement accounts, of some basic financial math. So even if the full FIRE experience isn't quite for you, the basic behaviors behind the movement are generally helpful to anyone's personal finances. So even if you want to work until you're 60 years old, even if you have no real dreams of retiring at 40 and traveling the world, understanding financial independence has some benefits. Of course, no movement like FIRE is without some sort of criticism. On the whole, I do think the FIRE movement suffers a bit from survivorship bias. Survivorship bias occurs when a conclusion is drawn based on incomplete data because some of the data has survived a certain selection criteria while other absent data has failed that selection criteria. So the fire stories that make headlines in, say, Forbes or CNBC, they sound amazing. They sound awesome. But playing a little bit of devil's advocate here, the stories on Forbes and CNBC are the ones that have survived for Forbes or CNBC to discover them and to discuss them. Those typical success stories, they are similar in some pretty striking and obvious ways. In many of these stories, we have a young, highly educated person working a high-paying job, you know, frequently with some sort of Silicon Valley-esque flavor to it. Maybe they're a programmer, or they work, you know, as a project manager at Apple, something like that. They do live very frugally, which is terrific for them. They make some pretty smart, sometimes lucky investments, you know, sometimes lucky meaning like maybe cryptocurrency is involved. Or in the past 10, 10, 12 years, we had this historic bull market in the stock market and, and many new fireys were big investors in that stock market. Good for them. And they end up retiring around age 30 or 35 or 40. And the way that these articles or stories are laid out sounds pretty easy. It's like kind of one, two, three, four. So the job itself, they're making 200 grand a year. That's a wonderful start. But that's not a realistic salary for about 99% of the U.S. population. Frugal living. We have talked about frugal living before here on the Best Interest Podcast. You can eat a lot of ramen. You can make some active decisions to save more money. I think that's a really smart thing to do. At the same time, it's hard for normal people to save 30% or 50% or 70% of their income. And that is something that a lot of the FIRE people are able to do. For starters, it's because they earn so much. And then on the back end, they do make some sacrifices in terms of their lifestyle. The smart and lucky investments. Okay, we already touched on that, but a lot of the fireys, they have stories where perhaps they bought their home during the previous recession, or they invested a ton of money around 2008, 2009 when the market was low, or perhaps they, they started a business on their entrepreneurial, or they invested in some startup. That's amazing. That's not necessarily something that the average person can assume will also happen for them. And then there are some glaring omissions when it comes to the typical or at least a common FIRE lifestyle. For example, frequently, people who achieve financial independence, especially at the super young ages, they do so without children in the picture. And children are quite expensive. In fact, I, I recently saw a stat, unverified, but I do think it seems reasonable. And it's something that I'm kind of putting a little flag in the ground and, and keeping it in mind. And the stat is that the net present value of having a child and, and the cost of that child over the subsequent 18 years is about $400,000, right? Kids are really expensive, but kids aren't always in the equation when it comes to financial independence. Really hard luck, bad luck scenarios don't often come up in the most famous fire stories. In fact, it's, it's good luck that makes for young fireys. Average Joes, average Janes, the people who are, you know, I'm a firefighter and I'm married to a teacher, they're rarely retiring at age 32. Because, I mean, who doesn't like the idea of retiring at age 30 and living the exact same lifestyle or that preferred lifestyle that you want to live? Of course, it sounds amazing. But there aren't many fire stories of, you know, hardworking pipe fitter works 20% overtime and retires at 36. That's not that common. Instead, there's a kind of a, a luxurious combination of elite earning power, really smart saving, frugal choices, sometimes a little bit of luck involved. 
that doesn't happen to everybody. And then in some cases, not in all cases, the fire movement really feels like a rat race. Fire hopefuls, perhaps brag is the wrong term, but for lack of a better term, they brag about their monthly savings rates, constantly living in the future, you know, five years until I'm fired, five five years until I'm independent, financially independent, and I'm counting down the days, burning the candle at both ends to both reduce spending and increase earnings. So I'm not trying to be an evil fireman here, quenching people's fire dreams. I do think fire is actually a great idea, especially I think the financial independence part of fire is a terrific idea. But I do think that the typical fire stories that we hear from the media are described in an unrealistic and and myopic manner. I do think that there are much more generally applicable fire stories out there, including some that we're going to hear later from Brad Barrett and that Brad frequently talks about on his podcast that are much more realistic examples of how normal people can achieve fire. A friend of the best interest, Christian, Christian actually just got married this past weekend, so congratulations, Christian. But Christian has said to me before, you know, Jesse, I really like your philosophies, but I'm also interested to know what actions, what direct actions can I take to apply your philosophies in my own life? So to honor Christian, let me try to give you some actions that you can apply to accelerate your your trip to financial independence. So for most people, the idea of retiring at 30 or 35 is not reasonable. It's like that kid in high school with, with no rhythm and no voice who adamantly pursued his dream of being the next Michael Jackson. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be famous or wanting to be a movie star or wanting to be a, a rock star. But at some point, we all have to look ourselves in the mirror and face reality. Unrealistic dreams, I say, are fruitless. So if this podcast has you interested in fire, absolutely pursue it. But make sure you set realistic expectations. So in my opinion, you should think about fire as follows. The tradition that you should retire at 67 or 65 or 62, that is not set in stone. It is very reasonable to plan a retirement earlier than that, 50 or 55, perhaps even earlier. But you should Google a fire calculator and and pencil out what your future fire could look like. Pick a reasonable age for you. Okay, second tip. Saving money is good. Saving more money is better. Plan for that future and think long-term. Now, whether you end up retiring early or not, it's good advice to save money. And the more, the better. Absolutely. The third applicable idea. If you're sick of the grind at work, say, the solution might be you need to retire early, but the solution might be something different. Instead, the solution might be find something you enjoy doing. Life is long. There's plenty of work left to be done. And and the solution to not enjoying work doesn't necessarily mean that you have to retire. It could just mean you need to redefine what work means for you. I can speak to that with firsthand experience wholeheartedly, right? My previous job as an engineer, my previous career was fine, but it did not light a fire underneath me. And after seven years of of grinding as an engineer, I did get more and more sick of it, for lack of a better term. And I was looking for something different. At one point, I thought that something different meant retiring early, pursuing fire. But once I change careers, I now love what I'm doing every day, right? I, I, I work professionally in wealth management. I'm helping people professionally in a similar way that I'm helping people on the Best Interest and the Best Interest podcast. And now I don't really want to retire early. I'm still on the, the path to financial independence, right? I'm still saving money. I'm, I'm still investing wisely in a, in a diversified portfolio. I'm, I'm pursuing, I'm, I'm acting on, I should say, a lot of the tenets of financial independence, But I'm not necessarily worried about the RE part of it. I'm not thinking about retiring early. I redefined what work meant to me. And and that really helped me prioritize my goals and and separate the FI from the RE. My fourth point or my fourth action is that people who are pursuing FIRE, they generally have a set of behaviors that's very much in line with the way I think here on the best interest. And so while I'm not always 100% on board with all of the FIRE ideas, I do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater or exhibit the the narcissism of small differences. So if you read FIRE blogs or subscribe to FIRE forums or listen to FIRE podcasts, I'm fully on board and I think you're going to learn something extremely worthwhile. All right, next I'm going to be reading and, and riffing off of an article that I wrote on The Best Interest and it was 
One of the probably bigger articles in terms of like the readership and, and the way it went viral, one of the bigger articles I wrote in 2022, the link is in the show notes. The article is called, You're Probably Using the 4% Rule All Wrong. So this article was uh, influenced by a great reader question, a retirement question from Michael, who asked, and I quote, so I often hear people say, if you follow the 4% rule, you'll never run out of money. But I thought it was just a high probability of not running out of money for maybe 25 to 35 years. Can you really never run out of money with the 4% rule? End quote. Michael's question is so good because the 4% rule is one of, if not the most frequently misunderstood retirement topics in general, but especially when it comes to personal finance forums, social media, because that's where a lot of financial independence content lives. And the 4% rule being this, this foundational rule of financial independence is frequently misunderstood. So let's break down and explain the 4% rule in simple terms. The 4% rule was created because retirees have always faced this really scary question. How much money can I withdraw from my portfolio without ever running out? That amount of money is called a safe withdrawal rate or SWR. Without a known SWR, it's really tough for someone to determine how much money they need in retirement, how much their total nest egg needs to be. Because how can a person feel comfortable that they won't run out of money? That is a stressful question. So let's talk about the basics of the 4% rule. The 4% rule suggests that retirees can withdraw about 4% of their retirement nest egg every year in retirement and never run out of money with some important caveats, which we'll discuss. So let's say I'm planning my retirement. After calculating my social security benefits, my small pension, and the thousands of uh, pennies generated by the best interest, I realize that I need an additional $2,500 per month to cover my cost of living. That's $2,500 per month or $30,000 per year. That's all going to have to come from my retirement savings. How big does my portfolio need to be to fund $30,000 per year? Let's just use the 4% rule. I should save 25x, 25 times, right? Because that's 100% divided by 4%. I need to save 25 times my $30,000 need. And, and I do that by saving 25 times 30,000. That's $750,000. If I save $750,000, I can withdraw 4% of that, which is $30,000 a year, to help fund my first year of retirement. That's the 4% rule. But now, let's discuss some of those vital caveats. The first one, the 4% rule assumed a 30-year retirement. The 4% rule has been back-tested many, many times. It was proven to work over a wide range of historical financial scenarios using real historical stock and bond data. The 4% rule had a 100% success rate for 30-year retirements, a 91% success rate for 35-year retirements, and an 89% success rate for 40-year retirements. Withdrawing 4% for 30 years, to be honest with you, even up to 40 years, that's pretty safe, right? An 89% success rate for 40-year retirements. Now, some of you might kind of be scrunching your forehead a little bit because 4% times 30 years, well, that's 120%. 4% times 40 years, that's 160%. How can anyone withdraw more than 100% of their portfolio? Of course, the answer is because your portfolio is invested. You're owning stocks and bonds and potentially some other investments in your portfolio, and they are growing year over year like a tree. You're pruning away some of the branches. You're spending some of your money, but new shoots will replace them. That's investment growth. 30 years is safe. 35 or 40 years, pretty safe, but not quite as safe because sometimes the new net growth doesn't always keep up with the pruning, especially the, the longer you prune for. If you are using the 4% rule to plan a 50-year a early retirement, a true fire retirement where you're going to retire at 30 years old, I think you're using the 4% rule incorrectly. You'd need to use results from a 50-year back test, which is going to yield something different than a 4% rule. It's probably going to be closer to a 3% rule. Okay, a second important truth about the 4% rule. The 4% rule assumes a 50-50 portfolio. It was based, again, it was on this assumption that a retiree has a balanced portfolio of stocks and bonds. The most recent back tests from a, a gentleman named Wade Fow, and he did this in 2018. He's a, a well-known PhD financial planner in our industry who does a lot of academic research on retirement planning. Wade Fow re-ran the study using a portfolio of 50% S&P 500 stocks, 
and 50% intermediate term treasury notes representing bonds. If you're using the 4% rule on a 100% stock portfolio or a 100% bond portfolio, you are using the 4% rule incorrectly. Because each portfolio, whether all stocks, all bonds, or a mix, and each duration, maybe a 30-year or a 20-year or a 40-year retirement, has its own safe withdrawal rate that you can use as a benchmark. But that safe withdrawal rate might not be 4%. When you, I hope you do, go to this article I wrote on the best interest with the link in the show notes, there's a very instructive chart that shows how long your retirement nest egg will last based on Wade Fowles' study. And I grabbed the data that he published from from a 100% stock portfolio down to 0% stocks from 30 years out till 60 years. And there's a very wide range of outcomes depending on how you want your retirement to look. As a very quick example, let's go to a 50-50 portfolio that we know that the 4% rule is based on. But instead of 30-year retirement, which again is where the 4% rule comes from, Let's go to a 50-year retirement. This might be someone who's going to fire, retire early at age 30 or 35 and wants to plan that they'll die at 80 or 85. What's the success rate for that kind of portfolio, a 50-50 portfolio for 50 years? The answer is that that portfolio succeeds only about 70% of the time with a 4% withdrawal rate. If you want to increase your percent of success to 90% or 95%, you'll need to change your withdrawal rate to between 3.25 and 3.5%. So the more bonds you hold, the less you can withdraw. The more stable your portfolio is, which is nice, but the less you can withdraw. And similarly, the longer you want to be retired for, the less you can withdraw. Okay, the next important caveat of the 4% rule is that the 4% rule is inflation adjusted. The 4% rule's creators were smart, and they included inflation into their backtest. So let's uh, revisit the example from before where I had to save $750,000 to withdraw $30,000 of retirement income in the first year of my retirement. Now, due to inflation, I might need to withdraw, say, $31,000 in year two of retirement and then $32,000 in year three of retirement. The creators of the 4% rule, they accounted for that slow creep upwards due to inflation. It's already built in. So the 4% calculation and then the the 25x rule that I used before, that's based on your year one spending in retirement, and it accounts for the inflationary cost of living after that. Okay, let's talk about what the 4% rule is not, because by understanding these common 4% rule mistakes, you can arm yourself against some poor retirement planning choices. The 4% rule is not a guarantee. It is not guaranteed to work for you. It worked in the past, right? It worked based on 20th century economic conditions. It worked based on the historic back tests that the creators chose, which included, for example, a lot of U.S. stocks and a lot of U.S. bonds. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, will the future, the next few decades, the next 100 years, will they mirror the previous 100 years? I don't know. Maybe we'll have a utopia, or maybe we'll have a climate crisis or aliens or a meteor that will damage the planet in some pretty bad ways and and make the 4% rule not work as well as we hoped it would. Now, that, of course, is the hard part about being human. We too easily fool ourselves into exuberant optimism or forlorn depression. If we Kathy Wood ourselves into a 20% annual return for the next 50 years, we could adopt the 10% rule and retire tomorrow. But if we follow people like Jeremy Grantham, who's a famous stock market bear, we might believe that the, the greatest depression starts tomorrow and even a 1% rule would fail. That kind of economic cataclysm would turn hometown USA into Mad Max. I try to stay in between those extremes, and that's why I use the 4% rule as a starting point. It's a guidepost. It's about as good an answer as we have. And the Trinity study, which produced the 4% rule and produced some other findings, is about as good an answer as we have. But it's not a guarantee. But it is, it's actually interesting. If we look at something that Bill Bengen, Bill Bengen is the, the creator, the OG of the 4% rule. If we look at something that he recently told the Wall Street Journal, he mainly holds cash, not stocks or bonds, due to his anxiety over high market valuations. Now, Bill was saying this last March and April, so he's looking pretty, pretty smart right now, actually. Maybe he was onto something. But it's interesting that even the creator of the 4% rule because of his own behavioral biases, because of his own anxiety, chooses to not hold as much bonds or as much stock as the study itself would recommend. 
And then there's there's other criticism of the 4% rule over the worry that it's not quite guaranteed. In late 2021, Morningstar, very famous financial news outlet, Morningstar issued a report suggesting that a more conservative 3.3 to 3.5% rule was the intelligent choice moving forward. And that, of course, would mean that retirees would need to save more. The difference between a 3.3 rule and a 4.0 rule is you have to save an extra, you know, 15 to 20%. And then another source, financial planning all-star Michael Kitsis, he published a response to that Morningstar article. And in, in the response, I should say, Kitsis explained why he thought the 4% rule was still very valid. Now, the reason why I'm telling you about Bengen and Morningstar and Kitsis is because even the best experts in the world can't agree on the 4% rule's utility. It's just a guidepost. It's not a guarantee. What else? The 4% rule is not aggressive, nor is it conservative. You know, saying something like, you probably shouldn't eat too much candy. Is that an aggressive admonishment, or is that a conservative suggestion? If you're a nine-year-old on Halloween, that's aggressive, right? Don't limit me. I want to eat all the candy I want to eat. But if you're a paranoid dentist, then that's conservative. Because why leave the door open to any candy consumption? Don't you realize that one mini Snickers can cause a cavity? That's kind of how the 4% rule works, too. If you run out of money in retirement, you would accuse the 4% rule of being irresponsibly aggressive. But you need to remember that the 4% rule was created to eliminate failure. Therefore, it can be very conservative for many retirees. And here's a, a crazy, a, a really crazy example of that conservatism. The aforementioned Michael Kitsis did a back test of the 4% rule on a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. Of course, the reason why Kitsis chose 60-40 is because that's a, a very common and kind of traditional retirement portfolio. And Kitsis found that retirees using the 4% rule were just as likely to quadruple their money as they were to decrease their portfolio by a single cent. Think about that again. If you retired with a million dollars over sometime in the last century and you used the 4% rule, you were more likely to die with $5 million than you were to die with less than a million dollars. And the reason why is because an investment portfolio typically compounds well beyond 4% per year. The 4% rule, it survives the worst markets, right? That's why it was created, to survive the worst markets. But then in average markets, the 4% rule absolutely thrives. So it's an important thing to keep in mind, and it's a reason why the 4% rule comes under some criticism, is because in the average market conditions over the past century, the 4% rule has been way too conservative. The next important thing to keep in mind, the 4% rule does not absolve you of taxes. You need to consider your own tax situation when applying the 4% rule to your life. Far too many people misapply the 4% rule by not considering their taxes. For example, rent, groceries, gas, let's say I spend $4,000 per month or $48,000 per year. If I multiply by 25, that's $1.2 million. Therefore, I'll need about $1.2 million in my 401k to safely utilize the 4% rule. Well, the problem, of course, is how that $1.2 million could be taxed. Dollars invested in traditional retirement accounts, like many 401ks, will face a future income tax. Dollars invested in a taxable brokerage might face a future capital gains tax. So the $1.2 million nest egg could easily end up being closer to $1.0 million after taxes are paid. And now, this person who needs $48,000 a year, they're withdrawing 4.8% on a million instead of 4% on $1.2 million. Now, that's not ideal. So... You need to account for taxes as best you can so that your total annual withdrawal, including the tax bill, is 4% of your year one nest egg. It's easier said than done, and it's one reason why uh, a financial planning help is really your friend when it comes to retirement income, retirement tax planning, cash flow planning, that kind of thing. One, one more interesting note about what the 4% rule is or is not is uh, a fun one on how wrong Dave Ramsey has the potential of being. So... I've said this before on the best interests, on the blog, on the podcast. I've even been quoted in some bigger financial outlets with, with this idea that Dave Ramsey is great at getting people from negative net worth to zero, right? He's great at getting people out of debt, but he's demonstrably bad at getting people from zero net worth to retirement. Now, one way is that Dave has recommended before that people use an 8% rule or an 8% withdrawal rate 
on a 100% stock portfolio. Now, we can test that out. We can see the efficacy of Dave's advice right there. In fact, we, we have some great data from the aforementioned Wade Fow from his version of the Trinity study that shows us for a 20-year retirement, Dave Ramsey's plan fails in 38% of back tests. For a 25-year retirement, it fails 46% of the time. For a 30-year retirement, it fails 57% of the time. And for a 35-year retirement, it fails 64% of the time. Dave Ramsey's plan, the 8% rule on a 100% stock portfolio, fails a lot. Now, for younger investors with a long timeline in front of them, a 100% stock portfolio might make sense if they are planning on 20 or 30 or 40 years of wealth accumulation. But 100% stocks is far too aggressive for someone with a long period of withdrawal in front of them, right? And that's what retirement is. It's a, it's a process of withdrawal. So big thanks to Michael, whose great question prompted this little blurb on what the 4% rule is and is not. The 4% rule is not a guarantee and has important caveats that are too often overlooked. Yet it remains a data-backed guidepost to help retirees and future retirees find comfort in their long-term financial planning. Last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about the cool math behind the savings rate and how even small changes in, in your savings rate can allow you to retire years and years early. So we're going to cover a basic concept that's going to allow you to retire potentially decades early. Imagine a married couple with the following statistics. They earn $100,000 per year in 2023 dollars. Every dollar they earn, of course, is either spent or saved. The saved dollars are invested and they end up growing at about 7% per year over many, many decades. And rather than use the famous 4% rule that we've been talking about today, they decide to use a more conservative 3.3% rule. That means our couple needs to save 30x their annual spending to comfortably retire. We'll come back to this idea in a little bit as well. By the time they retire, they'll be receiving $2,400 per month in Social Security, and that's measured in today's dollars. So that's a big boost to their retirement income needs. So the questions, of course, for their retirement planning is what do they spend and what do they save? That gives us the savings rate. That's what we're going to look at right now. And we're going to see the importance of their spending to saving ratio of that savings rate. The importance of that cannot be overemphasized. So first, let's imagine this couple. Again, they, they earn $100,000 a year. Let's imagine that they spend $95,000 and they save $5,000 per year. That includes everything. Taxes, groceries, the mortgage, all of it. At that savings rate, Starting at zero, the couple will need 50 years to build up their retirement nest egg. Now, I'm going to quickly argue with myself because by the time 50 years elapses, the couple is actually going to be pretty close to death. And if you're going to retire at age 80, you don't need 30 years of, of spending in your nest egg. So if there are this couple, by the time they hit year 40, they'll have about 15 years of spending saved up. By the time they hit year 44, they'll have about 20 years of spending saved up. And that might be a more realistic retirement date for them. But still, we're talking about 40 to 50 years before retirement is realistic for them. But now let's tweak their spending habits a little bit. Rather than spend 95% of the income and save 5%, let's dial it back to spending 90% and saving 10%. So now they're going to, instead of spending $7,900 per month, they're only going to spend $7,500 per month. And that $400 difference, they're going to start investing that. That simple tweak shaves 8 to 11 years off of their expected retirement date. They'll meet their future full retirement number in year 39. And again, depending on how old that makes them, they might hit a more realistic retirement number around year 35. But we can keep going. We can dial back the spending from 90% down to 85, 80, 75%. And each 5% increment for this couple represents $400 of additional savings per month. The reason why I, I emphasize that is because this money has to come from somewhere. You know, they, they can't just save money without spending less. They have to make some active decisions in their life to spend less money. But that allows them to save more and allows them to save time off of their retirement. So if they spend 85% and save 15%, they'll hit full retirement in year 32. At 80-20, year 27. At 75-25, 
year 23, and 70-30, year 20. So our first hypothetical couple spent 95% of their income, or $7,900 per month, and hit full retirement in 50 years. The final couple spends 70% of their income, or $5,800 per month, and they hit full retirement in 20 years. Now, granted, this 20 years of retirement savings, that might not actually be enough time to get them to Social Security age, but they really could retire decades earlier, technically speaking, about three decades before our first couple. So that's a 25% difference in spending, and that leads to a 250% difference in terms of retirement dates. That's 30 years of difference. It's not magic, nor does it involve top-secret investing knowledge. Instead, that underlying mathematical reason is just compound interest. A small savings difference early in life compounds into a huge retirement difference later on. Compound interest is something that everyone can harness, absolutely everyone, and every small percentage point counts. If you don't save much, like our 95% spenders, then every percent you save will buy you an extra two years of earlier retirement. And even if you're already a big saver, like our 70-30 people who spent 70% and saved 30%, even if you are a mega saver like then, for them, an additional 2% of savings buys them another one year of early retirement. It's still impactful. I know saving isn't easy. We all have bills to pay, mouths to feed, and there ain't nothing in this world for free. As they say, saving is hard, but it is possible. And now what's not possible in this life is getting back those decades of time where you're working instead of enjoying this life. So personally, I, I enjoy working. We kind of already talked about that a few minutes ago. I don't see retirement as this magical panacea. I'm not racing to retire decades early, but I don't want to work till I'm 75 either. I want to have that choice. And a small change today might buy us a world of flexibility later on. And that's a trade in our best interest. With that, let's bring on Brad Parrott here onto the podcast. Brad is the host of Choose FI. And we're going to pick Brad's expert brain about some fire topics. Hey, Brad, thanks so much for coming on the Best Interest Podcast. Jesse, I am excited to be here. This should be fun. Well, Brad, I hope I've done a good job describing to my audience. They're probably already familiar with you, but you are a financial independence expert. I hope it's okay <laughs> for me to say that. <laughs> and one of my personal favorite discussions, and I think it blends in really well with the kind of the FIRE mindset, is that money should be thought of as a means, not as an end, right? A means to an end, sure. But sometimes in the FIRE movement, and, and I got caught up this myself when I was really thinking hard about financial independence, is that my FI number, that, that financial goal, became too much of, a, of an end in my mind. So I'm just wondering how you think about that. And how do you personally ensure that money is, is a means but not an end? Yeah, I think this is a really critical thing because a lot of us in the FI movement are or have been maybe re recovering type A's, right? Where it's all about succeeding and doing the right thing and checking those boxes. And while I think there is some level of, of counterculture, right? By pursuing FI, I think it is easy to get swept up in the horrible keeping up with the Joneses just in a very different way, right? We're not keeping up with the Joneses with the McMansions and the BMWs. We're keeping up with the Joneses in oh, is your savings rate 57%? Well, mine's 59 and a half, <laughs> right? Like, look at how great right, I am. Or, right. oh, I'm going to cut that last little thing and, and get there. I mean, I, obviously you can tell I, I'm, I'm rambling because it's, it's, it's all nonsense. It's just, it's a race right. to nowhere. It's an absolute race to nowhere. And I think, I think what a lot of us have realized is the number, the five number, even when you get to five, which... I think by any definition, your life is dramatically better. And, I, and I'm not trying to argue otherwise. Your life is so much better pursuing FI than otherwise. The level of stress mitigation, the level of control that you have over your life, it's light years different than people who are just living to paycheck to paycheck. So it is unquestionably a positive. But to your question, 
it, you can get caught up in, oh, I'm going to reach this magical Shangri-La of my Phi number and it's all going to be unicorns and rainbows and I'm going to ride off into the sunset and my life is going to be perfect. Well, I'm kind of here to tell you that that is not the case. That is the furthest thing from the truth. And again, it makes it easier. There's no, there's no denying that. But you need to do the work. You need to do the work on what do you want your life to look like? And I think this is, is the heart of your question, right? Is like, what are we doing here? What lights you up? Yeah, Who do you want to yeah. spend time with? What does I'm, your day I'm, look like? I mean, you have, what, somewhere in the vicinity of 112 waking hours a week if you, if you sleep eight hours a night. And man, you got to figure out what that looks like because those 112 hours aren't going to be filled up by looking at a spreadsheet and like grinning to yourself, right? Like that's totally, not a life. Totally. It's, you just struck on something there, Brad. I, I realized in my own kind of fire pursuit that I, I was running away from something, being my old yeah. career, just as much as I was running toward FI or, or retiring early. And running away from something is is not a great reason to to alter your life or to change your life. And once I started my new job, which I like a lot more, I'm still pursuing FI for sure. I, I, like you alluded to it, it just espouses such great personal finance principles. But the concept of RE really hasn't crossed my mind in the last like 18 months. I, just, I like what I'm doing every day. And so because I've turned my life into a new direction where I'm enjoying this path that I'm on, the FI part still is huge, but the RE, not, yeah. not as much. Yeah. I think I think you've hit it. And I think so many of us have looked at this cute acronym, right? The FIRE. And, and there is some allure to the actual name. And I think that's why it sticks. But I mean, we are choose FI, not choose FIRE. Mm-hmm. And we very rarely talk about FIRE because frankly, the RE is just a distraction. It's it, people get caught up in the caricature of these 20 something kids sitting on a beach, sipping umbrella drinks, right? Like that. And, and it's so far from the truth. It's man, when you have this space financially, when you have this power and autonomy, you can add value to your life and the world and your community in ways that you otherwise wouldn't. And like you're saying, Jesse, that might mean a job that might mean paid employment for the next 50 years. And that's wonderful. Do what you want, but do it from a place of power. Do it from a place of choice as opposed to, I need this job or my life is going to come crumbling down in the next 90 days because that's everybody else. My life is going to come crumbling down in the next 90 days if I don't have this job 52 weeks a year. And that's not good enough. Right. It's a little scary. It's a little stressful too. My, my biggest thing is, I, I call it the success to stress ratio. Right. I shouldn't say it's my biggest thing. It's, it's one of my like pillars of how I approach these problems is if I think about a fraction, I mean, I'm a math guy. I know you're a math guy and I've got success in the numerator and I have yeah. stress in the denominator. I want to increase my success, of course, but I also want to reduce my stress. Increasing success while also increasing stress doesn't really improve my ratio at all. Uh, and so, right. I mean, living that lifestyle of on that 60 or 90 day timeline before your world comes crumbling down, that is a stressful yeah, place to be. It sure is. I love that ratio, by the way. And that reminds me of <laughs> something the writer Nick Majuli talked about. I think it's the return on hassle. If you have that as a mindset, this stress ratio or potentially, hey, is the juice worth the squeeze is another way of putting this yeah. return on hassle is this worth my time? Is this worth the effort? Is the marginal benefit that I'm getting from this worth whatever it may be in terms of time, energy, resources, stress, whatever you want to talk about? You need to really think about that because it's not just about maximization in every aspect. I I don't think success in life is about maximization. I think it's about living a good life and trying to find some level of balance. And I think, you know, balance can sound trite, but, but I don't think it's trite at all. I think it's, that is the key. And it, it, it's hard It's hard to come by, frankly. And we, we were talking about this before hitting record. It's, it's easy to say yes to things when things sound fantastic. It's easy to put things on the calendar six months out when if this were tomorrow, would I put it on the calendar? Well, maybe, maybe not, right? <laughs> I like that heuristic though. Maybe I need to start thinking about that, you know, as far as putting stuff on the calendar. Would I do it if it was yeah. tomorrow? Because that, that's, that's a different answer. It's almost like the, 
I, I don't want to say it's exactly the same as Danny Kahneman's kind of type one, type two thinking, but it's kind of related to that. I think what Danny Kahneman does talk about is current me versus yeah. future me. That it's very easy to make plans for future me, but it's much harder to make plans for current me. Hence why we do things like say, yeah, I'm going to run a half marathon this summer, but you wouldn't run a half marathon tomorrow. You know, yeah, something like, like that. It. Brad, I think I'm hoping we can dig in a little bit into you as a, as a specific example, because you reached FI at age 35. And some of our listeners are going to be sitting here thinking like, wow, that's amazing. How is that possible? What happened? And, and I know you've told the story on, on the Choose FI podcast a number of different times and a number of different episodes, but would you mind just giving us a few of the details, maybe how you went on your road from a, a starting point of, I have no idea what FI is, to this, not an end point, but a really cool yeah, mile yeah. post where you said, I'm 35 and I've now reached yeah. FI. Yeah, it's funny. It, it sounds remarkable when you say it out loud, but in our lived experience for my wife and I, it was just, it was just our life. And that, that's the funny thing. Like, and I will, I will try to answer every, every aspect of your question, but it, it never felt like, and I think this is the real important kernel is it never felt like we were doing something bizarre or different or that there was any level of deprivation that we were living some monastic life that like we weren't part of society or all those things. Like it was never like that. Like we have always felt that we've lived the same middle-class lifestyle as everybody else around us that just by making a couple of smart choices. And I know that's part of your question that we've been able to, instead of living paycheck to paycheck, we've been able to save somewhere in the vicinity of 50% of our income essentially every year that we've been adults. And obviously that has, that has plus or minus, there were years where it was significantly higher than that. And there was certainly when my wife stopped working, there were years where it was lower than that. But I think that 50% has, has been roughly accurate. And yeah, I, I think kind of going back to the beginning, because it actually does tie into like our mindset, finding FI and then making big decisions. So we lived on Long Island, New York. So high cost of living area suburb of, yeah, totally. of New York City, but but an hour outside, but still very high cost of living area. And my wife and I were both CPAs. I met her when I was 22. She was 23 and worked at the biggest accounting firm in the world. And we were, by all definition of, okay, where were we at that point? We were successful, right? Like we both did really, really well in school. We got jobs at this, this amazing firm. And the carrot is always there of, hey, if you work really hard, you could be a partner someday, right? And you can make 500,000 a year, a million or more a year, whatever it may be. And I mean, I think we both could have done that. But we, we kind of looked around and said, it, there were some of these little formative moments and, and it's probably almost too nuanced to go into, but like thinking of that carrot and seeing, I know like my, the partner in our tax department there at 2 a.m. with us on April 14th, literally copying and stapling tax returns. This is in the old days, right? And like, if that's the carrot, like, what are we talking about here? Like, this doesn't... Right. Is that the future that you're, that you're working so hard for? Is that the future that no, you wanted? It made, it made no sense. <laughs> so I think the backdrop is Laura and I were, and both are natural savers. So we both very smartly lived at home with our parents for the first couple of years, saved a boatload of money. I mean, saved every dollar that wasn't going to, to the little bit of student loans that we had. And we were able to save a, a nice nest egg. And when we got married in 2005, we kind of looked around and said, all right, look, we can make a life here on Long Island. We can, this is where our family and friends are. But is that the best decision for our future? Is that the best decision for our lives, for these future kids that we're going to have someday? Or if we lived here, are we always going to have to give something up? Are we always going to have to give up one of us staying home with the kids or saving for retirement or saving for travel or saving for college or whatever it may be, right? Like it didn't add up. So we made the very tough decision to leave Long Island and move down to Richmond, Virginia. And the cost of living here is a fraction of what it was back home. It's, you know, probably, well, now it's probably a, a half or more, but it was, it was like a third then. And that uh -huh. one decision, that was a massive, massive difference. Like 
I yeah. still remember we bought a four bedroom house in the nicest part of the Richmond metro area. And our mortgage back then was twelve sixty five a month, which is super wow. cheap. And that was a four bedroom house <laughs> yeah. where we lived yeah. for almost 15 years. And our girls really grew up there and it was wonderful. And it was, it was $1,200 a month. It was crazy. So at that point, Brad, well, first I was just curious, like roughly what, what age, maybe I missed yeah. that. How old were you when you moved to, yeah, to so Virginia? It was 2006. So I was, I guess, 27. And then to late 20th century. Okay. And then between when you started and when you were, when you had met your wife, your accountants on Long Island, and then you moved to Virginia roughly five years later, at that point, were you aware of this FI movement or were you aware of like the, the FI math and the savings rates and all that yeah. fun stuff? So, okay. Right. Trying to place the timing. I was not aware of the financial independence world, I think until Mr. Money Mustache. So it was probably... Okay. Somewhere in the early 2010s, I'm not sure, I can't place you within six or 12 months, but it was somewhere in that yeah. vicinity, <laughs> um, I actually had started a, a little personal finance website once we moved down here called Richmond Savers. And I got to know Brandon, the mad scientist, and Carl from 1500 Days became friends of mine. And then, yeah, I slowly started meeting some of these people who were my, my, kind of heroes in this world of like J.D. Roth from Get Rid Slowly and yeah, Mr. Money, you know, Pete yeah. from Mr. Money Mustache. So yeah, I mean, I think for me, that lightning bolt was finding Pete's shockingly simple math behind early retirement. And that, that one blog post was truly a lightning bolt for me and for so many other people out there. When, when you looked at, okay, we're saving money, but to what end? You asked about ends before, right? Like to what end? And oh. A, there's a whole community of people in the world who are like me. We're not just these strange weirdos who are saving money. And B, there's some certainty to this, right? It's just based on, hey, yeah, like what, yeah. if, what does my life cost every year? And then I basically multiply by 25. That's the number I need to reach financial independence. Like we can argue about the nuance of it, but man, Jesse, right? Like that's <laughs> the easiest thing in the world to, to conceptualize. It's like, okay, I control what my life costs. I multiply by 25. I'm a fi. Simple. End of story. Right. Right. You, you don't know this, Brad, but the listeners will know this, that during the first half of the episode, I dive into some of the nuance and I say why it's the 4% rule, the 25X rule. It's a good place to start. Yep. And from there, there's some nuance. If you, if you really want to get serious about making your retirement plan, you okay. should understand the nuances and, and whether you should tweak it, but it's a great place to start. Yeah. And I, and I love that you touched on that because I think it really highlights a little bit of, there's this, there's push and pull of people like us and just the FI community generally of, okay, you have to get your psychology right. And then there's some level, obviously, of getting the money right, getting the numbers. Like you said, we're both numbers people, optimizing. Like there's some push and pull here of, all right, I think if you had Big Earn from early retirement now on, he would say it is, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but it is like almost a metaphysical certainty that like, a safe withdrawal rate, barring a zombie apocalypse of 3.2% is going to work in virtually every case, barring the zombie apocalypse. Again, I'm putting words in his mouth, Carson. I'm not, uh, sorry if I got it wrong. But <laughs> so, okay, well then you multiply by 30 approximately or, or thereabouts. Like, I think, I think people of good faith can argue about the nuance. And I think it's legitimate, yeah. right? But for most of us, I think the aha moment goes from the drumbeat of negativity from the Susie Ormans of the world of you're never going to be able to retire. You need 10 to $15 million to retire. How could you, that's irresponsible to think of because what about healthcare? What about this? What about that? What if social security isn't there? Like, okay, that's fine. But when you switch from that drumbeat of negativity to, wow, I control this. The locus of control is internal. There's autonomy of my life costs X and okay, again, somewhere between 25 and 33 times what my annual expenses are, are going to get me to a point where I never need to theoretically work for money again. Now, like you and like me, most of us are going to earn money. So that, that's what's so great yeah. about this is yeah. like, we're probably being way too conservative because 98% of us are going to earn money. So going from 25 times to 30 or 33, like, yeah, that gets you again, this metaphysical certainty of the safe withdrawal rate.
But I think you're probably even being too conservative because again, the vast majority of us oh, yeah. are going to earn money. Are, are earning money or even, are you familiar, Brad? I'm, I'm sure you must have seen it once or twice over your, your time. Some of the data and some of the retirement analysis that shows how often a 4% withdrawal rate Actually, you end up with yeah. significant three to five times time the money you started with. Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. exactly. You're just as likely to end up with that yep. much money as you are to spend, draw down a right. single penny from your portfolio. So yes, we can <laughs> we can hem and haw about right three point two, four, five percent. I mean, four percent. Like I said, it's a it's a yep. good heuristic. It's a great place yep. to start. So Brad, we kind of okay. You've you've reached Virginia. You're you're in your your late twenties. At what point, maybe we can even fast forward a couple more years, you've discovered Mr. Money Mustache and this beautiful math behind behind financial independence. When did Choose FI, and I think of Choose FI, it's not only an amazing project for, for you personally, but it must have been a fantastic learning experience and this kind of encyclopedia of, of FI knowledge that you've built up over time. When did that come into play into your FI journey? Yeah. yeah, so it's interesting because I think my my whole FI journey has been really inextricably linked to entrepreneurship, which we really haven't. I, I guess I mentioned I started that that little personal finance site in, in 2013. But I think of my FI life, it's funny, how like the intersection of how you conceptualize your own life versus the reality, which is I think of my life as a traditional FI story, which is fairly middle-class income, I never made more than six figures in, in my career and just had a significant savings rate, like we were talking about before. And I, and I kind of shortcutted the answer because I think your listeners would be curious is it was a couple of big decisions. So clearly the living costs, that was massive. The cars are another, you look at the biggest line items in your budget and those are two of the three of them. And we drove, we both bought, so we had 2003 I had a Civic, my wife had a Highlander, and we drove those things until about three years ago. So about 17 years for each, wow. right? And yeah. like, that is a massive difference. If you ever want to see like a, a crazy comparison of somebody managing the payments of, hey, I'm going to lease forever, or I'm going to get a new car. Even people think they're doing well when they're getting a new car only every five years or something, but they're continually just paying, paying, paying. I mean, I've run some analysis on on this and it can be a, a nearly million dollar decision on just having, and that's on like a fairly old school payment. I, like I, I did this based on like a $300 a month payment, which now is seems quaint, but over like a, an investing lifetime, over a driving lifetime, it can be about a million dollar decision just basically driving a car into the ground and then even doing something quote unquote suboptimal and buying a new car every 15 years, not even doing the used car thing. So like, I think there are ways to optimize it even more. But frankly, that's, again, the nuance, it, it, you get bogged down in that. But I think for me, the important part is, man, if you cannot have a car payment every month forever, think of that money that you can stockpile. And then if you have a significant other or a spouse, you're doubling that up every single month and investing it. And just it just compounds over years and decades. And you don't think of your life as a long time, but this is 20 years that I've been doing this. And we've had a car payment s such a tiny fraction of that time. Yeah, I'd seen some stat recently, Brad, and I, I couldn't find the exact stat, but the average car payment right now in the US, as of a, a couple months ago when this article was written, $716 yeah. per month for a new car. And, and when you think about it, maybe some families have two new cars or have two car payments at least. So you think about that, $1,400 a month, yeah. that's the average. Some people are significantly higher than that. There's this other stat, Brad. This is, again, this is from the end of 2022. 15% of drivers who bought a new car at the end of 2022, in the last quarter of 2022, are paying more than $1,000 per month on their car payment. And that was the, the highest percentage of $1,000 per month ever recorded. I cannot, I mean, I can't imagine. Imagine a 60-month a, a or a 72-month loan for a car, this depreciating asset, at $1,000 a month. Yeah. It's a little bit scary. And, and, and to your point, it's not that I'm against people spending their money in a way that they want to. However, the, the, the opportunity cost of this expensive truck payment versus some used car that's going to get you to work the same exact yeah. way and then invest it over the long run, when you look at those dollar differences, 
which I, I bet was probably part yeah, of your Yeah, it was. Analysis. And it's funny, I just pulled up, I have a bi-weekly newsletter that I write in, and one that came out in February was actually updating my analysis. So yeah, the original was like a $300 a month car payment. And yeah, the stat I saw was I think 777 per month was the average. So, you know, we saw roughly the same number. And yeah, yeah I mean, using this example that I set up of this person basically doing this over a 45 year driving lifetime where they had three new cars where they even paid 777 a month, which I think, I think is preposterous, but like I wanted to play along with the game and then just don't have car payments for 10 years at the, the backside. So it's a 15 year cycle versus somebody paying mm-hmm. that 777 a month for every month of that 45 year period. The difference in net worth was $2 million, $2 million for one car. Now, again, double that up. If you have a spouse or significant other, that's a $4 million difference. How many people do you know with a $4 million net worth period? Not less, right? Like right. not less. We're just talking about the Delta between the net worth they would have had versus what would have happened here. It's, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Well, it, it is. It goes back. I think it's a Morgan Housel quote from his, from his very excellent book, Psychology of Money, where he says, wealth is what you don't mm-hmm. see, right? And, and the choice is either you can drive that nice new car and get a new car every five years and, and have that recurring $700 monthly payment every single month for your entire life. Or you can choose to drive your cars into the ground on this 15-year rolling basis like you've determined, like you've analyzed. But in that case, what you're seeing is that car with rusty hubcaps, and you're seeing that car that definitely looks a little bit outdated. What you're not seeing is the fact that wealth is growing in that person's investment yeah. account. Right, wealth is what you don't. Yeah, that's see. a brilliant quote. Morgan is is one of the best, and I love that one. And, and like you said, I think it's important to not judge people based on their decisions. And I think that's that's one of my biggest takeaways. Kind of going to to your actual question about choose a pie. One of my biggest takeaways is personal finance really is personal in the sense that people value different things. And I think it's easy for me to talk about cars because I don't value cars at all. To me, it's just a means to get from one point A to point B, and that's it. And there are people who get a lot of value out of their cars for whatever reason. That's fine. That's the thing. But you need to make decisions, right? Like you can't, if you're living paycheck to paycheck now, or you're going into debt every month, well, you have to make some decisions to make your life better. It's just plain and simple. You have to cut expenses, or you have to earn more income, or some combination thereof. The numbers are pretty simple at the end of the day, right? Like that equation, we can talk about being math people, but like, that's not a hard equation. That's the simplest math in the world. And you are going to have to make some decisions, but it's not my place as some dopey podcaster, Brad from Choose a Fi, to talk from on high of like, you need to do this. Like, I don't care how you spend your money. Do do whatever you want. That's, that's the thing. But damn, you got to make decisions. You really do. You have to take action. Right, right. Or, or you can't you can't make decisions to spend in in too many different unique ways, but then also have the expectation that you are going to retire no. decades early, right? Like you, you got to pay the piper. Uh, you have to sacrifice in one place to make something exactly. else work. And it is it's, it's such a fun exercise. And I'm sure you've encountered this in some way that budgeting or planning your spending or thinking about what really brings value to your life they're all related. And it's it, I find it pretty enjoyable because I get to say things like you know what for me I I love. I love going to the gym. I love working out. Specifically, I really enjoy racket sports. So for me, paying for that gym membership at a, at a kind of a nice gym here in Rochester, that's worth it for me. But I don't really like golf as much. So I'm not sure, like, it, it doesn't bring me joy to, to belong to a golf club. You know, it's just like, what, what do you like and what do you not like? And where do you want to spend? And where are you going to decide I'm not going to spend anything at all? Yeah, and I think... Part of the fun of this also, and how I've always conceptualized FI, is it's, okay, we're living the same middle class or upper middle class lifestyles, everybody else around us, just we're getting wildly wealthy in the process, and they aren't. Because it's, it's turning life into this fun game where we can succeed wildly by not really doing anything that crazy. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's the house, the car, as we talked about. And for a very mm-hmm. long time, it was being very mindful of cooking our own food. I mean, literally those decisions made the difference between essentially having no savings rate and having a 50% savings rate. Plus or minus, like that's that's the vast majority. The 80-20 of of FI was just those three things for us. So, and and 
yeah, then you get into, okay, this, this becomes fun. Like Pete from Mr. Money Mustache calls it the skill of spending. And I actually had him on recently on the podcast. And it, it's interesting because the skill of spending becomes, okay, on the front side, the early years in FI, it's how can I get more out of my money? How can I find those, I, I hate the phrase, but, but those little hacks to get ahead, right? <laughs> but, but when you're in the beginning and you, again, you start from a point of no savings or no savings rate, you need to make decisions and then you get that level of skill with your spending. And then I think, frankly, on the backside is so many of us have become so used to this, this level of skill. And I, I don't think it's deprivation. I don't think it's being a miser. I, I, I don't think any of those. But because like you said, Jesse, so many of us are going to end up with more money than we ever know what to do with because we're so conservative with it because we've built all of these safeguards in and 33 times and not counting social security and not counting another dollar that I'm ever going to earn and not counting, frankly, just the normal variance of even if you withdraw 4%, like you said, you might end up with three to five times the original amount of money just based on there's a certain percentage of likelihood of that happening. So, I mean, man, we built so many safeguards in to the point of, okay, well now I've tried to build a lot of conversation into the FI community of, all right, think about a book like Die With Zero. Think about how do we maximize the, the really precious years we get on this planet and wishing them away or, or not maximizing them in the sense that if you're going to die with too much money, you really need to rethink that because that is not the optimal way to live either. That, Brad, has been a, a big realization for me personally, is this idea that saving is great, saving for the long run is great, having these FI goals is terrific, but at the same time, living your life today and finding some balance between saving for the long run, enjoying life today. And right, I, I have no interest in, in dying atop a, a pile of gold. <laughs> Scrooge McDuck right? like, like I want to, right, exactly. I want to I wanna enjoy, I want to enjoy life. So I'm trying to think, where did, the, where did this bring us back to? Oh, yeah. So, so you, 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 <laughs> I took us so far off track. <laughs> no, no, we, we went to a terrific place. So, trust me. I was there with yeah, you. So you asked about, about Chooseify and how it started. And, and I went off onto the tangent of, hey, my entire Fi life has really been this entrepreneurial journey that I, that I don't necessarily right, think of. And right. So yeah, I started that, that little site, Richmond Savers. I wound up getting some a claim for putting a trip to Disney World together for my family using credit card rewards points. And it was awesome. I was like in the New York Times That's and cool. on CBS yeah. and NBC. It was all these wild <laughs> things. And then I realized, okay, I can't do this. I, I actually was trying to help people one-on-one. -on -one. So I took like my accounting brain and tried to make it a real world online business, actually, that Richmond Saver site where I help people figure out travel rewards and they would use my links to sign up for credit cards. So it was like this really win-win okay. beneficial thing where they wouldn't pay me any consulting fees. I would literally get on the phone with people at my lunch hour <laughs> at, at my CPA job. It was, it was wild. So I'm like, okay, this is not doable, but I've proved that this could work as a business. And then basically I left my job January 31st, 2015. So it's more than eight years ago. And the very next day I started a website called Travel Miles 101, where I basically was able to then scale that travel rewards coaching. Right. So, okay. you know, it's funny because I, I say that I reach FI at 35 and it's, it, it depends on your definition, I suppose. So I think by any definition, we were nearly there in terms of the 25 times expenses. Were we exactly there? Probably not. But I think in conjunction with the little bit of income I was earning from Richmond Savers, we had reached five and that was the 35 years old. Right. But yeah. why, why I'm kind of saying it this way is like we were talking about, you're going to earn money once you reach five. And right. You're yeah. going to do something. You're going to have a little side income. Exactly. Absolutely. So I have this travel miles 101 which was a nice success. And I've fortunately, even just with, with that site making you know a decent bit of money, but nothing spectacular, I have never had to draw down on my, on my nest egg of net worth, which, so even though I'm at FI, I 
maybe to my detriment because I can't I can't talk about this in like a lived version. I've never had to withdraw money from my net worth and assets. So, you know, it's funny. That's obviously a good problem to have, right? I'm not going to lie. But but I think from the podcasting perspective and just being able to explain to people how exactly it works, I just don't have experience with that. So then, yeah, very much fast forward and, and really where the, the story culminates is I was on the Mad Scientist podcast as Brad mm-hmm. from Travel Miles 101. And interestingly, this guy from Richmond, where I was living, named Jonathan, heard me on that podcast. He's like, oh, this guy, Brad, is from Richmond. He's into financial independence and into travel rewards. I'm all of those things too. So Jonathan shot me an email just to like my contact form on one of my websites. And for whatever reason, he's like, hey, let's grab lunch sometime. And for whatever reason, I said yes. And the rest is history. And that was like the meetup. And then four months later, he reached out to me. He's like, hey, I have this kind of off the wall idea to start a podcast. Do you want to try it with me? And yeah, I mean, that really fast forward us to the beginning of 2017, which was when we launched Choose If I. And, and it's pretty wild how it all just kind of blew up in really 2017, 2018. That's amazing. <laughs> that is so cool. I mean, it's so cool on, on so many fronts. I mean, not only the first off, I have a lot of respect for that kind of journey from Richmond, uh, was it, sorry, Richmond, uh, Richmond Tra- Savers, actually. Yeah, the, Savers, the, the, the worst Savers. named website in the history of the world. <laughs> <laughs> but still, from Richmond Savers to Travel Miles 101, which, correct me if I'm wrong, that website is it still, still exists. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Still functioning. People can go visit it. We'll, <laughs> we'll throw a link in the show notes. But then one of my favorite takeaways and what, one of the biggest benefits I've gotten from running the best interest, the blog, and now the podcast is these little interactions that you, that you never know when they're going to come or where they're going to come from or how someone's going to find you and then where those interactions end up. They go to some really cool places. And, and this email you got from Jonathan or just the fact that you were on the Mad Scientist podcast in the first place and then whatever was the, the predecessor to being on the podcast, if you go back in time, the chain of events that got you to choose FI is pretty unique and cool. Yeah, it's bizarre to think about like how my life would be so <laughs> different if any one of those series of events didn't happen or happened happen differently. So yeah, right. you never know where life is going to take you. I think what I call it is the luck surface area. And it's like, how do you increase Ooh. your surface area for luck? And anybody who's intellectually honest knows that luck plays a large factor in success. And if they say otherwise, they're either a fool, lying, or an idiot. So, uh, <laughs> but you need to be prepared, right? Like that's not to say yeah. just go off blissfully into the world and expect luck to find you. It doesn't work that way. It's how do you build a skill stack? How do you build a network of friends and colleagues that you never know, to your point, like you just never know where that's going to lead you. And I think I think there is a lot that just serendipity plays into your life and the world and you never know where life is going to take you. And I mean, I am the biggest case in point, like obviously 10 years ago, or really eight and a half years ago at this point, I was sitting in an office doing corporate state tax returns for the largest baking business in America. (laughs) What a bizarre, and now I have the largest financial independence podcast in the world. How is that possible? A combination of, just like you said, some, some hard work, a couple lucky breaks, some more hard work, another lucky break. You keep on going, you're having fun with it. I think you hit the nail right on the head. I, I don't think either one should be overlooked though, Brad, because I mean, I think anyone who's listened to your podcast knows it's extremely entertaining and educational. It's everything that people want in a podcast. So the skill is there, right? But sure, I mean, a little luck never hurts. And, and it sounds like by your admission, a couple lucky things happened and boom, yeah. there you go. <laughs> anyway. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you so much, Brad, for, for coming on here. And I feel like now is as perfect time as ever I'm sure if, if people wanted to find Choose FI via the, the, the beautiful <laughs> Google algorithm, it shouldn't be too hard to find. But just in case, we'll throw a link in the show notes. But, but how can people find you? Who typically listens to your podcast? I mean, who's, whether it's your ideal listener or, or maybe another way of phrasing it is, is if I haven't listened to the podcast before, I'm not sure it's for me. How do I know it's for me? And, and maybe where should I yeah. start? Wow. Okay. That is a great question. I don't have the perfect answer, but I have, a, I have a pretty good one, I think. So I think hopefully just hearing me talk for this last 30 minutes gives you a sense of what you're going to get in terms of there's no dogma. I'm not judgmental. 
I am a pretty open-minded guy who is exploring and is just trying to figure out life and trying to pass that along. And I think this is not just the nuts and bolts of money because that's pretty boring, frankly. It is how do you live a better life in every capacity, relationships, health, wealth, giving back, whatever it may be, finding value. And I think that is what makes it I, hopefully an interesting listen. And also you're going to get a little bit of education. You're going to get a little bit of inspiration. And most importantly, I think what I'm still astounded by to this day is there is something about what we put out that compels people to take action to make their lives better. And that is the secret sauce of Choose If I, is you're not going to listen to the podcast and just kind of go on with your day. There's something weird. There's some weird alchemy about it. And I don't know, Jesse, you're laughing because I'm laughing too, right? Like there's no, I don't know why, but there's some alchemy about it that it compels you to take action to make your life better. And I think that's something we all can get behind. So like, yes, I should have a better answer of, hey, people in their 30s and 40s are, are the vast majority of our listenership. Or, I, I don't really know because I get emails from 18-year-olds who just found us. I get emails from 70-year-olds who just found us and everywhere in between, every background, part of the world. So yeah, I mean, it probably would be better if we were gearing it towards one subsegment. But I think what's so beautiful is I think the message can really help everybody. I truly do. So yeah, if you're listening to this podcast, obviously just search choose, like make a choice, choose FI or the other way to really get in touch with me is just get on my newsletter. So choosefi.com slash subscribe. And I personally handwrite that email. It goes out every Tuesday. And if you hit reply to that, it's coming straight to me. I can't promise that I can reply to every single email, but I read every single one of them. So, so yeah, that's really the best way, both from a macro level and a micro level. Awesome. Brad, thank you for coming on to the Best Interest Podcast. This was a terrific conversation. I'm going <laughs> to listen to it. I know I'm going to enjoy hearing it again. I'm sure the listeners are too. And listeners, go check out Brad and choose FI. I appreciate it, Jesse. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Best Interest Podcast. If you have a question for Jesse to answer on a future episode, send him an email at jesse at bestinterest.blog. Again, that's jesse at bestinterest.blog. Did you enjoy the show? Subscribe, rate, and review the podcast wherever you listen. This helps others find the show and invest in knowledge themselves, and we really appreciate it. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Best Interest Podcast. The Best Interest Podcast is a personal podcast meant for education and entertainment. It should not be taken as financial advice and is not prescriptive of your financial situation.